How's that for an intro? Welcome to my personal nightclub. I <laughs> love very- it. Uh, hello, thank you for tuning in. Uh, this is uh, LinkedIn and Facebook Live with a special guest, Kate Bakos from Kate Bakos Property and President of the Real Estate Buyers Agent Association of Australia. Thank you for joining me, Kate. What an intro. Um, I'm pleased to be joining you and what a finale to the year. Yeah, what a year it's been. Uh, we're not going to talk too much about pandemic except for the premise of this whole research piece. So apologize for that in advance. But it's changed the way that investors are behaving, in my humble opinion. So the reason why, of course, we're doing this Facebook Live is in 2019, we did some research where we looked at the distance between where people live as their principal place of residence and where they're buying investment properties. We also just released a new study that looked at the change in that distance across a couple of different uh, categories uh, for properties that would have transacted during the pandemic. And Kate, you had some amazing insights back in 2019. So I wanted to get you back to talk about the changes this time as well. And spoiler alert, it's further away. What can we talk about with further away before we share the actual data? Well, in terms of um, your findings, Mike, you know, I've been working with with buyers throughout the, the pandemic who have been pivoting with decisions and, and the, you know, buyer attitudes and criterion has reshaped itself as a direct result. And so this information, while it's investor information, is really telling you about how investor attitudes have changed too. So I'm delighted you've asked me. Thank you for coming on. It's always good fun. Now, the distance between uh, where people invest and where they live back in 2019 was a surprising number for me. It was an average of 293 kilometres. So in a way, you could almost make our data tell whatever story you wanted because we found that you know, just around about 7% of people actually invest in the same suburb. And I guess what I was trying to tease out is this this kind of pervasive idea that property investors like to buy around the corner from where they live because they can drive past it and check on the tenants, make sure it's not on fire. Um, Also, they tend to have more property knowledge or at least local area knowledge in the suburb that they live. So there was an idea that those stats were going to show up. But 293, and this is excluding people that live overseas because that destroyed the numbers, that that still seemed like a reasonable distance for me. Do you remember being surprised by it? No, not really. No, look, certainly when you delve into the the individual decisions that people make, there's always surprising data. But that particular figure, especially if you're dealing with um, investors who have multi-property portfolios, they generally will try and diversify. Not not everyone carries that com- comforting bias that you've got to buy in your own suburb because it's the best or because you can drive past it. Yeah, and I guess that was born out in the statistics, which we're going to uh, show right now. Um, so if you have a look at the graphics we've got here, let me uh, get rid of that banner thing. That's going to, no, that's, here we go. Come on technical issues. I hit the height. There we go. Um, so you can see on the right-hand side, that was our 2019 uh, data. So we've we've got 6.9% of people investing in the same suburb. In red, you can see the average distance that people are investing from where they live and the magic figure for this data series. So these are really properties that were purchased from the beginning of the pandemic in Australia all the way up to the end of November when this study finished. The average is five. 505 and 59. So a pretty sizable increase in the distance people are buying uh, from where they live. What can you read into this, Kate? Well, if I'm simplifying it, everyone wants a piece of Queensland. But if I look at it objectively, you know, that that's almost double the average distance. So this is absolutely compelling, Mike. And we had a, a quick chat about this data when we zoomed in on, on distances um, from home and we could really see that there was a, a dramatic shift in more than 200 kilometres and more than mm. 1,000 kilometres. But what it says is we've really embraced borderless investing because the the amount of um, or the change for over 1,000 kilometres would put a lot of investors into a different state. Now, the only surprising element for me there is the inability to inspect in person and to have a, a traditional um purchase set of steps 
if you're buying in a lockdown city. But let's face it, Melbourne wasn't the most popular city for investors during 2020. And even for those who wanted to go into New South Wales in, in 2021, uh, when they had their extended uh, lockdowns, they were still able to inspect property one-on-one. -on -one. It was only Melbourne and Canberra that were completely unable to to set foot in a property. So it, it definitely shows an appetite for, for borderless investing or for, for um, you know, crossing the border to find a property. Interesting you talk about, I guess, the stark differences between Queensland and Victoria. Victoria has has suffered uh, incredibly. I don't need to tell you about that. You were on the ground for, for everything and guiding the REBA members and the real estate community at large about what could be done. Queensland obviously is is fared a lot better than the vast majority of states in the country, certainly New South Wales and Victoria. Um, I'm just mm -hmm. pasting in the comments um, here, our, our research, uh, let me see if I can pull this up. So our figures indicate that Queensland was the most popular investment destination with 37.44% of transactions happening there. Next was 34.31% uh, and Victoria was just 11.31%, um, the rest yeah. of the state was 15%. So Queensland is the, the real winner from a property investment point of view. How much of that transaction uh, amount, the 11%, the such a low figure for Victoria, do you think is a result of that extended lockdown? Wow, that's a good question. Look, I, I think sentiment counts for everything when it comes to investment decisions. People will be loath to invest in something that they're fearful about its short-term performance of. So we we had really difficult lockdowns. There was a lot of doom and gloom chit-chat about the Victorian market. The reality is there were parts of Victoria that, that weren't gangbusters. It was really hard to buy anything in our regions. And I, I do a lot of work in Geelong and Ballarat. Days on market felt like hours. It was really tough. And those areas weren't impacted by extended lockdowns like the capital city was but i have to i have to say looking at the data and understanding the headwinds that that melbourne faced namely horrible lockdowns lots of job losses industries that were really closed down um, no new arrivals and yeah. certainly our um our, our city rental markets were really badly impacted as well because we just had no students and I thought that that would be a really difficult blow for Melbourne and I didn't anticipate when all of this was unfolding that we'd have the growth that we've had. And we've done over 16% for median dwelling values for the, the rolling 12 months from November and that's quite a shock. So while it's not matching the 25% the plus um, capital growth figures for some of the other cities, I think Melbourne's done incredibly well and I'll talk to you at length any time about the the indicators that that I've seen um, out there and in particular you know the way that we've recovered even our rental market we were so oversupplied and we had horrible vacancies and, and negative price movement on asking rents and that's turned around quite surprising mm. because we haven't opened the gate to new arrivals at all. It certainly has and that's um it's another Facebook Live that we've done on the uh, rental loss index, which we'll we'll have a look at it again. I think in the new year because Melbourne inner city apartments were showing huge rental losses due to vacancies, mm -hmm. and that's tightened right up. And I suppose the whole country was quite tight from a vacancy point of view. It's really just those inner city sort of apartment markets, and that's starting to get even even um, quite tight in in certain yeah. pockets. I'm wondering when it comes to Queensland. What is what is the driver for that being the most popular state for investment in our, in our study? Do you think it's a result of, you know, perhaps being locked down in in Victoria, and you kind of think if I'm going to be stuck in my house, I may as well have nice weather. I always try and get in a Victorian Melbourne sort of jag, um, little you do. little stab at you. <laughs> each time you know if i'm going to be locked in my house it may as well be sunny uh or, or is it something that's probably a little bit more pragmatic i.e the price point because the media has talked for probably 15 years about how brisbane's going to boom because the asset price to say median wage earners um salary is 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 so much more approachable and achievable than it is in certainly sydney and 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 melbourne as well do you think that's what's maybe making queensland more popular yeah it's a combination of things and i think one is the obvious one is is price point yeah. 
The second one is when things are doing well, everyone wants to jump on the winning horse. So there's a bit of that. We're saying, you know, a bit of herd mentality there. And we've also witnessed really tight vacancy rates and growing rents. So for anyone who's looking at their cash flow and really assessing different markets, it definitely looks good. We've got our speculators out there who want to to jump on board the, the games and perhaps capitalise on the city's growth um, as we ramp up for the games. And if you think back to, to Sydney's growth leading into the Olympics, uh, it was colossal. So there'll mm. be lots of people who are banking on that happening and and whether there really is a, a direct correlation or not is yet to be seen. But, you know, there, there's definitely been talk about that as well. And then finally, you and I both know when people want to earmark a future home for themselves or a future holiday place or whatever, it's all, you know, done under the guise of it being an investment decision. And, and hence, while it still is an investment, you guys get the data. Mm. Yeah, and of course, we can only really look at the investment data, but we've also found that 25% of investment properties are actually occupied by the owner before they become a rental. So sometimes it can be a little bit broader than that. But I think that's a really, really interesting point that you struck on, because if you think about you know, a holiday home or a lifestyle destination. Queensland's probably up there. I mean, you do have to yeah. admit the weather that's better than both where you live and where I live. I, I wonder if um, the pandemic and and that sort of dual purpose, which is maybe poor investing advice, but maybe lifestyle factors into it where people want to buy something that they can see themselves in down the track. Do you think that's been yeah. heightened by the pandemic, i.e. people wanting to have um, what I talked about um to a journalist, to, which was a mistake, as a bug out <laughs> property. I, I, I've been watching these doomsday prepper shows. So I, I was said to a journalist, I think people are looking at like a bug out place. She's like, I've never really heard about that. And then it went in the what? domain. So I apologize for that. <laughs> I love it. You've thrown a random theory out there and <laughs> shaped down our news reporting. Uh, no. I, I do think that most definitely. No, it's been a really tough time for lockdown cities. I, I know chatting to Sydney siders and Canberrans, uh, they, they had the blues when it was at its worst and, you know, Melbourne had a double dose and it was awful. So a lot of people, you know, just packed up their bat and ball and took off. Mm. What about the regions? Obviously, we, we can see in the data that uh, Queensland, uh, I'll pop that up on the screen again, Queensland got 37.44% of all the transactions uh, according to our data. Now, with, with the figures that uh, have come up in the study, I'll check that in again. Um, yeah, you can obviously see that the distance has increased and the percentage of people that are buying more than a thousand Ks from where they live or more than 200 Ks where they, where they live is, is, is pretty significant. How much of yes. that is, say, Queensland from a, a Victorian purchasing there or, or a Sydney side of going to, to Brisbane? And how much do you think that is actually just the regions of Australia from a, a price point um, point of view? And I guess maybe a a pandemic point of view where you want a bit of space where the air is a little less COVID-y, if I can, mm. can invent the term. Yeah, great question, Mike. What what really struck me with the, that data was the 200-kilometre change was pretty dramatic, but it wasn't double in, in terms of percentage. The 1,000-kilometre was more than double. It was double and a half, which is significant. And that spells generally interstate or a very significant move from home well investment from home if if someone from a, a capital city market was investing in, in a nearby region you wouldn't expect to see a thousand kilometers not across the board anyway um mm. so i i think that it it's quite telling there that there was a lot of interstate investment activity and in terms of preferences being shaped and people wanting more yard more space more kitchen more study that's an owner occupier trait it's not an investment trait. So when I was talking to to buyers who were wanting to either move out of the city or buy their first property out of the city, they had a set of criteria that echoed all of those things because we we could only order Uber Eats or you know order delivered food. We couldn't go out, and so we started to embrace our own kitchens, our ability to cook. Everybody was posting pictures of their bread. Um, we we saw people wanting good kitchens and we also saw a lot of people wanting good backyards, good gardens 
and you know that that clean living type um, scenario was a common theme when I was having interviews with prospective buyers but they're all owner occupiers anyone who was looking at investment wasn't really all that cognizant of COVID they were, they were clearly wanting to make sure it was a good investment choice and that their investment wouldn't be derailed by lockdowns but it, it definitely wasn't um I didn't, I didn't see criteria being reshaped. What we do need to have a look at, though, is the increase of investors in the market. Since our um, 2019 loosening of credit following everything that went wrong, we had that awful trifecta of Banking Royal Commission and pending federal election and, mm. uh, you know, we'd, we'd had a credit crunch. It was awful. All of that kind of culminated in investment activity coming to a real standstill. And then the banks probably thought, oh, my gosh, you know, we've really got to do something about this and the regulator let credit relax a little bit and, and investors came back in slowly. They didn't pile in. And mm. we've seen them gain momentum, you know, gain traction now. And even with the macro potential changes, hasn't put investors off. But what we do know is a lot of investors are, are quite a lot more comfortable with lower price points. And any whose whose budgets were impacted by macro prudential changes would have just opted for a smaller price point still in a region. So the the region's performance hasn't solely been based on city dwellers escaping. It's also been based on investors returning and investor price points are generally around the $600,000 mark. So the most recent CoreLogic report shows that that's a, a standard investment budget um, at the moment. I've got some, uh, that's a really good point and I'm going to dart over to have a look at my data on that, which I've got on the wall from 2019. But I think... Um, Buyers agent Sam Lally has shared some interesting points in the comment. Uh, this is his synopsis of 2021. And I think it's something that we can <laughs> all identify with. Um, while I have a look at that data, let me just put up uh, a question here from Marty Sadlier. There's been a stark increase in the number and use of buyers agents in the country. Is the vast distance increase due to the rise of the buyers agent, do you think? Oh, good question, Marty. Um, chicken and egg that one I think people have been able to facilitate interstate purchases with confidence when we've had you know a really difficult um, set of challenges with domestic interstate travel I think the rise of buyers agents on oh, the, the proliferation of, of purchases that have included buyers agent assistance is a combination of things where we're watching TV programs um, with you know buyers agent, scenarios some of some of them are more real than others but um we're seeing you know a, a lot of that and I, I think also um you know in terms of um people being at home and being a bit bored and researching property they, they've had the time to do that so a lot of our our purchasing activity um during 2021 was were accidental purchases but they were investors who had made a decision oh you know let's Let's look at this and, you know, boredom leads to circling in on an area and next thing they know they're buying a property. Mm. Just darted we off screen. We lost for a us. moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I actually took myself off so you didn't have to see the side of my head. Um, the, the, latest, the latest sample that I have to hand, uh, that uh, what investors are, are spending on houses versus units versus townhouses, was between April and December 2019. So the average price was 705 k for a house, 595 for a unit and 546 for a townhouse. Let's say we index that to what's happened with prices and we're talking, say, 780. There's not a lot of places left um, with high density uh, populations where you can buy something for under 800 grand, is there? So, you know, it, it really brings more into play units or regions. Yeah, very true. I got quite a surprise when I went through the core logic data and I was having a look at, at the, the median growth rates for all combined regions nationally. So I didn't segment them very well, but it, it did um, segment that, that figure into houses and units. And I've always assumed that when someone goes into a region, they will want to buy a house, they won't want to buy a unit. And sometimes people go into regions because it's their opportunity to buy a house as opposed to buying a unit in a capital city. Mm -hmm. So what was a real surprise was that the capital growth across the year end for combined regions showed that units and houses have almost done the same. I fell off that my is, chair. That is very... Um... That is very unusual because the difference 
say to a capital city is houses are doing about twice as good as units are from a yes. capital growth point of view and a and a yield well, i should say the rental um income increase as well so that mm. that is that was a real surprise what what do you yeah. put that down to oh, i've scratched my head for a long time i still can't completely put it down to anything unless there's you know lots and lots of high rise and cool and gather that <laughs> people have pounced on i think that it, it suggests obviously this isn't just investor activity when we're looking at the core logic data. It's also, you know, local buyer uptake, owner occupiers. So possibly we've seen an increase in um, in regional people making the decision to buy and get out of the rental trap potentially. And if they've been um, price prohibited from housing, they would have gone for a unit. We have obviously seen our fair share of of small apartments in some of the the regions and particularly Queensland, um, but not only Queensland. All I can think of is that investors are really determined to chase rental yield because you and I both know that you'll get a stronger rental yield on a unit than what you will on a house. And it's amplified when you're going to a region because the land values are lower. Mm, yeah, that's that's a good point. And with the money doing so little in the bank, yield's been uh, very popular. I've got a comment from Rod saying, I believe uh, buyers are starting to understand how a buyer's agent can help add value. Now, obviously, that's a big part of your role is to, is to help educate Australia how buyer's agents uh, add value. Uh, and it's, you know, it, it's, it's something that I think is, is evolving differently in all parts of the country. It's, it's accepted practice in, say, the eastern suburbs of, of Sydney. It's almost weird if you don't have someone representing you, whereas there are still regions where it's like a buyer's agent. How does that work? Isn't it, isn't it free to work with a real estate agent? How, how much do you see buyer's agents uh, influencing this data, i.e., will we con continue to see uh, a, a bigger range between where people live and where they invest because they can have trusted people on the ground to run these transactions to understand the local market and the local real estate participants? Oh, there's two answers to this. I, I genuinely think that the data that we're seeing is a direct result of the inability to, to travel interstate easily. So people would would love to jump on a plane and do their own legwork but if they're really determined to invest and they can't cross the border then the next best option is to have a buyer's agent to have really good dialogue and to you know live vicariously through them and i know a lot of a lot of people that i was able to assist during um during the pandemic were were really keen to feel like they were they were super involved so it was almost like you know virtual reality for them and it's important as an advisor to recognise when someone wants to feel the journey as opposed to when they're super time poor and they just want a result. And we yeah. saw a, a lot more journey um, style adventures. But I think when when our borders reopen and, and we get a grip of this thing, buyer's agent activity will, will continue to grow. But I think that thousand kilometre type data has been skewed by the pandemic, not by the rise of buyer's agents. Mm. I think you're right. And we'll, of course, check in uh, once this um, germ subsides a little bit. Um, we've got a comment. Marty's back on the keyboard. He's having a red hot day I love out. Marty's questions. This is great. <laughs> Will the future of buying property see a rise in armchair purchases with the investor using consultants to buy, view and secure the property and never leave the house themselves? You've sort of you referenced that a moment ago that people actually do enjoy the sport of going to open houses, inspecting things. Uh, yeah. I couldn't think of a worse way to spend the, the weekend, but a lot of people no. really like yeah, to great. do that. <laughs> yeah, well, you must, otherwise you're, 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 you're living uh, living hell every day. Uh, do you think that once people once people are allowed to go and do that, the buyer's agents will perhaps have have less of a value proposition or there are there so many more skill sets that come into play that yeah. people don't realise like negotiation and, and that sort of thing. I suppose you have to say that, right? No, look, it harks back to why people want buyer's agents. If they want buyer's agents because they can't get on a plane, well, that, that that's a pretty sad outcome. People source buyer's agents for all kinds of reasons and they'd be, they might surprise you people assume that you know if a time poor individual wants wants a property they just you know bring in the big guns but it's not that's not the dominant reason why i get work um and it depends on your niche as well so for someone who's servicing expats well that will be the dominant reason but for for me i find that there's a fear of getting it wrong and that's an enormous um, reason for reaching out whether it's paying too much or picking a dud no one wants a lemon and no one wants to overpay 
Uh, some people are just absolutely terrified of bidding or negotiating. And then you've got others that are, are mistrusting of agents or they've been burnt or they know someone who's been burnt. And they're just some of the reasons why people reach out to a buyer's agent. And I think those reasons will continue to, to deliver us um, willing clients because, you know, they're, they're the gaps that we fill. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think the expertise of a buyer's agent uh, will shine through no matter what the uh, lockdown or market situations are. Let's um, let's finish up with your finger on the pulse of the local market. You were sort of calling, um, I read some of your stuff recently that said that the fever pitch is, is subsiding a little bit. You're obviously still very busy. The days on markets aren't rocketing up to 90 or anything crazy like that, but you no. feel like we've sort of come, come off that that fever pitch only only for now that's my thinking so yeah. you know the melbourne market if, if we can talk about even the victorian market was rocketing along and going crazy as soon as those gates opened and what happened was for the three months that we sat around twiddling our thumbs and eating tim tams we saw agents pushing back their campaigns with their vendors because they couldn't start a campaign if, if you couldn't let anyone see the property we couldn't have get photographers through so every vendor that was prepared to sell or wanting to sell this year couldn't get started in July, August, first September beginning. They had to wait it out. So by the time you've got your gardener through, your photographer through, your floor planner through, the agent's saying, well, well, we'll get you on for October and we'll have a really short campaign or we'll have your auction in November, December. And that's what happened to every vendor. So instead of having a September start and a December 24th finish, we had all these campaigns hit at once, just flooded the market. We had record high um, auction activity. So last week and the weekend before are the two highest auction number and intensity weekends Melbourne's had in a long, long time. Mm. And it felt like it. Everything was condensed. All of a sudden houses are competing with other houses. Buyers are over it. They're tired. They're excited about Christmas. They're really celebrating the pub's reopening and the cafes reopening and restaurants reopening and everyone's having parties so a lot of buyers were distracted with with the genuinely fun things in life and going you know what I've been hot on property all year but right now I'm super distracted and super into my lifestyle and even though it was most likely the best time of year to be purchasing in my opinion it was definitely the best time of year to be active the last two weeks um, a lot of people were just saying no I'm prioritizing my friends or my family or the party or whatever it was. And so all of a sudden we've seen this crazy supply demand imbalance get a bit more like that, but not, mm. not for very long in my view, unless we have really strong stock volumes coming on next year. I don't think we'll see that condensing again. If, you know, dare I say it, we have any lockdown activity. Uh, we can anticipate that our listings will be meted out more, more evenly throughout the year. So we won't have that glut of stock. And there's a core logic chart that I keep circling back to and I just can't get over it. If you look at new listing volumes versus all current listing volumes, and I saw it in one of your um, your pieces of data out there not, not long ago, if yeah. you have a look at it, the new listing volumes are really high. We've got a lot of properties coming on the market and a lot of vendors have obviously got, got confidence in selling now because the pricing is really good for The prices are great and... Yeah. Uh, and that they can, they can take the property to market with confidence and not be worrying about snap lockdowns. So we've seen a flood of vendors. But if you have a look at total stock on market, that includes old stock, which is over 180 days on the market. So it's half a year of something sitting around doing nothing. Mm. That stock has diminished. So what it means is that buyer appetite is still very, very strong. And we're circling in on all kinds of stuff, like the stuff that's been hanging around that we didn't want a year ago. Yeah. So buyer hunger is still there. It's just that the vendors flooded the market and the agents condensed it all. I think that's what's happened to, to Victoria and to Melbourne in particular. And I'm not anticipating that we've seen the bottom of it. I think we've had a little bit of a lull. Interesting. Now, I am going to ask you as a final question, uh, your prediction for 2022, which is a question I know people like you just love. Um, yeah. I'm going to go to a couple of quick comments first. Peter uh, Caraglanis, the value of buyers advocates isn't, uh, just in identifying properties and purchasing, it comes in the education strategy and execution of the future wealth planning of vendors and investors. 
That's a very That's good great. endorsement of buyer's agents, yeah. and I agree with that. Um, we've got uh, Rod back on the line. With, the, with cost of build costs going up in some cases up to 30% due to materials and the zero immigration component yet to hit the Australian market, I believe it will get harder to secure a property. The need for a buyer's agent to represent their clients and secure a property off market is going to be an edge uh, for buyers. Uh, I couldn't mm. agree with that more. Um, and certainly we've seen uh, housing approvals um, very low and, and yeah. you know, certain components like timber frames uh, costs going up 70% during the pandemic. So it's crazy. Um, give us your crystal ball stuff for 2022, Kate. Wow. I think that when we welcome new arrivals back, that will be an enormous growth driver. And when you contrast that in tandem with the, the limited building starts, as you've just alluded, I'm watching a lot of, a lot of buyers um, make the decision to buy because They've done the cost-benefit analysis on staying put, avoiding the stamp duty, doing renovation and extension. They're weighing that up and saying, you know what, I'm actually better off paying agent selling fees and stamp duty and upgrading the home. So we will have some pretty strong headwinds um, that the buyers will be facing next year. So we've got the combination of uh, our international borders reopening and we've got... Um, We've had a fair amount of change with people scuttling in and out of, of capital cities, lockdown cities. Mm. We've also got a federal election looming. We know what people yes. do when we get close to them. They sit on their hands and do nothing and worry about what might happen. And then once the election's all over, whatever the result is, we all get on, on with our life again. So I think that we'll still have strong um, seller's market conditions next year. Maybe not as mental as this year, but I'm not prepared to call that yet. What I do think we'll see, though, especially if we get on top of of um, the pandemic and if uh, if we don't get any more surprises, too early to say yet, but if things continue to track okay, I think we might see people reverting back to the city. Not not crazy numbers of people, but I think there'll be an acceptance and an embracing of, of our capital cities, especially the lockdown cities that people did flee from. Yeah. And as we know, the hybrid arrangement doesn't work for everyone. And not every workplace is cool with hybrid or and certainly a lot of workplaces who were okay with completely working from home and now calling people back in. Yes. And I think those who are living further from the city than a comfortable commute, whether for them it's a two-hour, twice-a-week thing and they're okay with that or whether they're getting jack of travelling for an hour, three days a week, whatever the tolerance is, I think it'll wear thin. So I believe that we'll see people reverting back to the city and importantly, our disparity between housing price growth and unit price growth is at, at its greatest that it's been in in decades and there's got to be a degree of elasticity to that. We won't keep that parity sitting where it is. I think it, we'll see it closing a little bit. Interesting. Well, time will only tell, won't it? But uh, it's going to be an exciting year nonetheless and with this election it's good to hear that uh, that housing uh, and negative gearing isn't on the agenda. So who knows what the battleground for this election is going to be yet. I don't think that's, I don't think we, we actually know. Um, but we'll of course chat to you throughout the year. You've got a well-earned break hopefully coming up, Kate. So thank yes. you very much for coming on and, and sharing your insights into our research. It's always a pleasure. Oh, totally. Mark, pleasure's mine. Thank you. Cheers.